بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد سيد الاولين والاخرين على اله وصحبه اجمعين وبشرح صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي uh, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with some peace and blessings upon our beloved messenger Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon his blessed family and companions and those who follow them until the end of time. Uh, brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome to our last gathering, subhanallah, uh, especially for those of you since the um, beginning of COVID, mashallah, as well as those for you were regularly at the IC. Uh, alhamdulillah, um, before as well as after. So we've been reading, alhamdulillah, for this te- from this text of Abu Hamad, rahimahullah, al-Ghazali. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and all of us, inshallah. We're going to read a little bit today. And then tomorrow we have our session on Quranic du'as, and then inshallah we'll be there on Friday uh, to say uh, our, our salams to everyone, inshallah. So last time, uh, Abu Hamad rahimahullah, mentioned that if we look historically, if we look through history, we can see that um, all fitna, all evil uh, starts with the nafs. And he gives a really powerful example of shaitan, who at that time there was nothing actually to even trigger him externally. There was no existential challenges, but his desire for power, his envy, his arrogance, and eventually his disbelief were simply the cause of him not checking his nafs. And he says, Rahimahullah, nafa'ana Allahu ta'ala bi'ilmihi fi darini amin khara wa la tajiru fil khalqi fitnatan wa la fadihatan wa la dalalan wa la ma'asiyatan illa wa asluha al-nafs. The Imam, says, and you will not discover in creation any trial or test or an act of misguidance or an act of disobedience except asluha, asluha, its origin is the nafs, wahuwa, wahawaha, and the hawa of the nafs. The hawa are those, those things that cause the nafs to lean towards evil. Hawa definitions desires, but sometimes desires can be good. So the, the connotation of hawa is something negative. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, one najami idha hawa by the stars as they fall. The original meaning of hawaitu means I came down. That's the literal meaning. The figurative meaning is that when someone follows their desires, they will eventually be brought low. Whether in this world, due to living irresponsibly, or in the next world, or both. Then Sayyidina Imam, he says, If that wasn't the case, there was no nafs, then creation would be in a state of tranquility, peace, and good. وَإِذَا كَانَ عَدُوٌ بِهَذَا الضَّرَرِ وَإِذَا كَانَ عَدُوٌ بِهَذِهِ الضَّرَرِ كُلِّهِ فَحَقَّ لِلْعَاقِلِ أَنْ يَهْتَمَّ بِأَمْرِهِ He says, if that's the case with this enemy, the nafs, then it is the responsibility of any intellectual, any intelligent person, any intelligent person, to pay close attention to this thing. The nafs. Wallahu ta'ala wariul hidayati wa tawfiqa tawfiqi bi fadli. That's where we stopped last week. Then he says, Fa in quot, and if you say to me, Famal Famal Hilyatu e dandana fi had al adubi wa matad birufi amrihi fa bayin lana dharik. And said, maybe somebody will ask, like, how do I control and administrate and deal with this kind of enemy? What's the strategy? to handle the nafs. So Abu Hamad is going to provide us two strategies. 
فعلم and when classical scholars in, in ancient books they say يعلم they want you to pay attention فعلم أن ذكرنا فيما تقدم أن أمرها أن أمرها عسير صعب he said don't he said you recall that previously we mentioned that the topic of the nafs the nafs themselves are something very difficult and harsh إذ لا يمكن قهرها بمرة كسائر الأعداء because you can never completely wrestle the nafs into submission like you can other enemies إذ هي المطية والآلة and there's a reason for that. And his language is very precise. He says that's because al matiya in the classical Arabic is a mount that a person would use to cross a desert. Hadihi al matiya Halas. That's a matiya wa ta. Here he's using it figuratively as if to say, as central as a mount was to the desert Arabs for survival. The nafs in our lives is something that we're always mounting. Like we, we need it. We can't live without nafs. Wal'ala, and it's the tool that we use. And we know that the nafs is something incredible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa nafsin wa ma sawaha fa'alhamaha fujuraha wa taqawaha. Many of the scholars say nafsin is say to Adam. Others, they say, no, the meaning of nafs is nafs. But you'll notice in Surah Shams, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the indefinite. Wa nafsin wa ma sawaha. To show sometimes in Arabic when the Arabs want to highlight the excellence of something, even though it's known to people, they still present it in the indefinite form to show that it's impossible to restrict its importance and it's good. They also do this with bad things. So Allah says about Sayyidina Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً نَا أَرْرَحْمَةً رَحْمَةً لِلْعَلَمِينَ We sent you as a mercy. Because the Prophet in his mercy cannot be limited, cannot be defined. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about the Quran. He says subhanahu wa ta'ala وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ Not أَشِفَاءُ So here, this un you hear is called tanween or nakira which implies indefiniteness. It cannot be defined. Point that I'm making is also the word nafs in Surah to Shams, even though we all know a nafs. Let's say don't kill the soul, because we all know the importance of souls. But in Surah to Shams, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, نَفْسٍ نَكِرَ تَنْوِينَ Why? To show how amazing, subhanAllah, and how important the nafs is. And that means that the smart reader of the Qur'an is going to pay attention to the nafs. Because just as it has great potential to do good, it has incredible potential to do harm. SubhanAllah. And this is something we lose maybe a little bit in translation. But Sayyidina Shaykh, uh, Sayyidina Imam Abu Hamid says, Rahimahullah, إِذْ هِيَ الْمَطِيَّةُ وَالْآلَةُ That the nafs is like a mount that you use as well as a tool, alat. And ala for what? A tool for what? A tool for good or a tool for evil. Waqil, it was said, in the Arabian, a Bedouin person. And in, 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 the, in the ancient times, in the early days of Islam, the word A'rab, when it was used in the context of language, was a form of praise. The Bedouin, to be a Bedouin in ancient times, before the third century, after Hijri, that was an honorific. 
because the, the Bedouins were known to be the people who held on to pure language. So when he says waqila, and the word qil, it means like this is maybe not true. What's called sirah to tamrid. I wish subhanahu if we had time to continue. I have a class on how to read classical texts. Of course, someone needs to have a decent uh, level of Arabic. And one of the things that I teach people is what's called sirratu tamrid, from the same word as marad, sickness. Waqil means like it's not necessarily strong. Waqil inna a'rabiyan da'a bil insan bi khair. So it was said that there was one Arabi, he made dua for some people for good. And he said, And he like, may Allah subhanahu wa help you to overcome all of your enemies except your nafs, because it's not possible. It's not possible. That's why Sheikh, he says, He said, and it's impossible to ever like feel like you can completely have it under control as well as to neglect it because of the great potential of its harm. Baina Tariqain. We said, the Sheikh now he's going to give us that way, that method to deal with the nafs. He says, if this is the case, as I've said to you, he's presented very textual arguments and some logical arguments. Imam Abu Hamid Rahimullah. He said, then there is something that you need which rests, which lies behind two ways. There's a path that runs right through two paths. You need that center path. And of course, this is like an analogy. He's using rhetoric. He wants to help us. What's called in Arabic, tajsidul afkar, to give a body to the ideas. To give an, a, body, a body to an inanimate object. What we call isti'ara. He said, and it is turabiha wa tuqawiha bi qadri ma tahmilu fi'la kulli khayrin wa tudafuha wa tahbisuha ala haddin la tatamada fa anta min amriha fi ilajin shadidin wa nadarin latifin. He said, and the way to do this, what is this way? Between and what he means by two paths is two extremes. The extreme of being too relaxed. Wallahi, our ancestors were more cautious of how they lived their life, even though our spiritual ancestors, even though they lived in a time of great taqwa. We have to ask ourselves, and I have to ask myself. Am I more cautious because of my current environmental circumstances? Or are the environment, environmental circumstances, aka being in America, wherever we are, Washington, D.C., New York City, wherever, are we using them to justify being relaxed? Then that is counter to the way of the early Muslims. The early Muslims lived in a time of incredible religious commitment, societal religious production. That's why the quality of their religious institutions was very strong. Religious education was very strong. We can uh, probably say that Muslims are more influenced by things which the early Muslims would see as not important. And today's Muslim may look at the early Muslims and censor them and say like, you're also influenced by things which today's Muslim may seem, see or view as being secondary. But subhanAllah, this is a mistake. We should be more committed to our practice. We should continue to locate faith and worship as an escape from a ever encroaching material world.
which is not only impacting what we like, it's also impacting our values, our standards. So Imam, that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ibadatun fil fitna kal hijrati ilayhi. This is a good hadith. The Prophet said to worship Allah in difficult times is like making hijrah to the Prophet. At my school, inshallah, in, in the late winter, we plan to do a conference, worship, worshiping during times of fitna. Because we find two extremes. One is, you know, because the world I live in now is so relaxed, then that should drive my religious adherence. So since the world is relaxed, since the world is, is dominated largely by uh, economic heathenry, let me buy into that. The other end, the other extreme that Abu Hamid is talking about is the extreme of being religiously irrational, trying to do more than what the Sharia asks us to do. We find both of these are censored in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the first don't follow your desires because it will take you away. Don't follow their desires, it will lead you astray. But the other, but that harsh lifestyle that they created for themselves, talking about monks, Allah says, we did not prescribe that for them. So Sayyidina Abu Hamid, rahimahullah, he says, a tariq bayna tariqain. He means the path of the sunnah, the path of the sharia, which identifies what's important and the intensity of importance I should give to those things, as well as what's not important. What we call surat al-mustaqim. Ihdina surat al-mustaqim. For Sayyidina Shaykh Rahimahullah, he says, Thumma, so you have to strengthen. He says, this is that middle path. You have to strengthen your soul. I have to strengthen my soul with worship, with good, and to continue to try to expand its strength, its capacity, and then to weaken, weaken its capacity with evil, with evil by staying away from evil and avoiding it. فَأَنْتَ مِنْ أَمْرِهَا فِي عِلَاجٍ شَدِيدٍ وَنَظَرٍ لَطِيفٍ He said, therefore, when it comes to the soul, like this is a very difficult remedy. Because what I see oftentimes is even hyper-religiosity masks a disease of the heart. When that man came to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, أَعْدِلْ يَا مُحَمَّدْ Be just with us. The Prophet said, if I'm not just, who's just? That man thought that he was more just than Sayyidina Nabi ﷺ. That's, that's crazy. In the name of religion, he actually thought he was more just than the Prophet On the other end, the people who neglected ibadah. Those people, those hypocrites in Medina who worship for them was simply a means of social, economic, and political utility. So utility. So they were on the other end. Where's the middle? And that's why the madhabs are important to learn. Because in many ways, the madhabs are the embodiment, uh, the embodiment of, of moderation. Because moderation is a subjective term. So we talked about this before, that when it comes to ambiguous terminology, we have to balance it with fiqh, if it's related to practice. If it's related to theology, we have to balance any ambiguous term with aqidah. So here we see the role of Islamic sciences in our lives, especially in post-modernity, where terms are being used and changed at a, at a record speed. But remember this, if there's anything you remember in the six years we were together, remember this, what I just told you. It's very important. That is that when we come across terms which are very subjective, whether it comes to issues of faith, practice or what they call spirituality we have three sciences that we return to to define those ambiguous terms and to make sure that my own subjective self-interest are not polluting the true meaning of the term as found in the sharia the role of aqidah is the voice of sharia on theology 
the role of fiqh is that is the voice of worship uh, on these issues. The role of tasawwuf is that it is the voice of proper, moderate spirituality. I don't like that word, I'm just using it so people understand. So that's why we learn. And that's why the Quran is the key to all and the sunnah because they contain the language and understanding of these concepts. So when we use the word moderation, I remember 12, 15 years ago, Islam is a moderate religion. You ask, for example, you know, Daniel Pipes, what does it mean Islam is a moderate religion? He's like, as long as people don't pray, that's not, that's not moderate. As someone else, they're like, you know, most of the Muslims are astray, all the Muslims are wrong. That's not moderate. So how do we define moderation when it comes to theology? Books of Aqidah. La ikraha fi deen. There's no compulsion in religion. But at the same time, there's principles. Laqad kafara ladina qalu in Allah thalithu thalatha. Allah said those disbelieved who said God is one of three. Laqad kafara ladina qalu in Allah Uzair ibn Allah. Those who disbelieve who say that Allah is Uzair ibn Allah or that Jesus is the son of God. That, that's a principle. That's moderation. Also with fiqh. So what Abu Hamad is talking about here when he said between the two paths is the sharia. And the voice, the khitab of sharia on issues of faith, on issues of devotion, and on issues of spirituality. And that's very important for us as we navigate America. For those of us in the United States, that we shine the light of the sharia in these different areas. In these different areas. Then he says, Rahimullah, Thumma Qad Dakarna fi Amriha and Tuljimaha Bilijami Taqwa. He said, and then you remember that we talked about having to bridle, right? To actually hold back the nafs. Just like a horse is held back. That's called Lujam. How do we restrain the nafs like we restrain a horse with the reins? With taqwa. And what does taqwa mean? He defined it and he went through it earlier. And taqwa means the obedience of Allah and avoiding sin, coupled with sincerity and faith. And this goes back to what I said earlier. What does wara mean? Wara means to be cautious. Because just because something is permissible doesn't make it wise. Right, we could be tested with the permissible. So al wara means to be cautious. Imam al Shafi'i he said the wara is to avoid the halal, fearing that you fall into the haram. Now it's the opposite. People don't have a problem negotiating the haram. But the early Muslims, the Prophet said every religion has its own peculiar, peculiar characteristic, and the peculiar characteristic of Islam is al wara. To be cautious. So then I can use the madhabs. Here we go again. What does the madhab say is makru? I should avoid that. What does the madhab identify as being haram? I should avoid that. And that's why we have to be very careful. When we throw out madhabs, I worry sometimes this language of revival is just masking a serious attempt to undermine the historical efforts of our spiritual ancestors to cut us off from the history of what Muslims have been negotiating and engaging with for almost 1400 years, a little over 1400 years. So if I look at a madhab and it says, this is makru, I should stay away from that as best I can. So I increase my capacity for wara, wara, caution. This is haram. I should avoid that. The Prophet said, what I forbade you to do, you stay away from it. There's no negotiating. That's what I... So the historical legacy of Muslim scholarship doesn't mean that it's perfect. We should look at it constructively. And if we're scholars, we should look at it critically. But in general, it has negotiated many of the questions that we have today, and it's told us where to be cautious and where to 
be relaxed. So you see, you have to restrict your soul, rein in your soul to achieve that taqwa and to achieve that wara, to check ourselves, to be introspective. It's not easy. For in قلت, he said, if you say to me, he said, perhaps you're going to say to me, and here again he's using rhetoric, this beast that you're asking us to rein in is very difficult. It's very wild, meaning the nafs. It refuses to be domesticated. So how, like, how do we do that? What is the remedy that we can pull that off? He says, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّكَ فِيهَا صَادِقُ وَالْحِيلَةُ تَظْلِيلُهَا حَتَّى تَنْقَارَ لِلِّجَامِ He said, you know, this is a very sincere question. And the remedy for this is to debase. The, and what he means by tadliluha is to rein in the negative qualities of the soul. To the point that they're debased. And how do we do that? By understanding what's good. By knowing what's right. By knowing what Allah loves. By knowing what the Prophet wasallam taught us. By knowing what the Ummah has agreed upon. Hafidahullah. So you, you rein it in and you humiliate it until it does what's called inqiyad. Inqiyad means it becomes submissive. The ulama, Abu Hamad al-Ghazari says that the ulama meaning the ulama that he knew when he was around and he had studied with. They said that you can rein in your nafs, debilitate the evil of your nafs, using three things. Only. Man'u shahawat. The first is to prohibit it from what it desires, meaning evil desires. Sin, to prohibit it from sin. وَثَانِي حَمْلُ أَثْقَالِ الْإِبَادَةِ عَلَيْهَا The second is to try to push it, to carry what you don't like, what you and I find difficult in worship, what we find heavy in worship. Man, I don't want to pray to Hajjim, man, I love to sleep. So, okay, go against your nafs. I don't want a voluntary fast, man. It's hard for me because I like coffee. So the hamil, the most heavy things that that force like those things and how do you know it's heavy the nafs don't like it not heavy because i don't have the physical ability to do it that's different or the mental capability of doing it that's a different situation what he means by it, it's heavy on the on the lower nafs that it doesn't like it he said uh said imam al he says like when you find the nafs like ah do it. Do what aggravates it. And that way you increase and I increase its capacity. He said, and the third is to humbly turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek his aid and seek his help and plead with him to help you and I to address the lower nasul lamara to bisu, the evil component of our nafs. So again, Sayyidina Abu Hamid, Rahimahullah, he says there's three things you can do to help stay on that middle path to discipline nafs and rein it in. The first, he said, man'u shahawat. 
to prohibit it from desires. The second, he said, Rahimahullah, Hamlu Athqal al Ibadati, Hamlu Athqal al Ibadati, Ariha, to push it to observe those acts of worship which the soul finds difficult. وَثَارِثُ الْإِسْتِعَاذَةُ بِاللَّهِ عَزَّ وَإِسْتِعَانَةُ بِاللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ وَتَضَرُّعُ إِلَيْهِ بِعَنْ بِأَنْ يُعِيدْ نَكَ عَلَى ذَارِكِ Third, he said, is to seek Allah's help and to humbly plead with him for his assistance. وَإِلَّا Because without that, فَلَا مَخْلَصَ أَمْ تَسْمَعَ قَوْلَ يُسُفَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ there is another qira'a. Sayyidina Qalun, inna nafsal amaratu bisu wila, wila na ila, ma rahima rabbi. Fa idha wadabta ala hadihi al umuri thalathati, an qadat laka al nafsu al jumuhu bi idni lahi azza wa jal. Says, so if you stay consistent on those three things and I stay consistent on those three, three things, interrogating ourselves and avoiding the evil that our nafs want, pushing ourselves to worship when our nafs become uncomfortable, and then seeking Allah's help humbly, and sincerely, that if you do that, then your nafs will surrender to you by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you'll be free and emancipated to reign in the nafs and you'll be safe from its evil. Mm. Then maybe someone is going to say to me as we finish, inshallah, can you clarify for us what is taqwa? If you keep talking about taqwa, taqwa, taqwa. What is it? Subhanallah. He said, You should know that taqwa is kanzun aziz. It's an incredible treasure. فَلَئِمْ ذَفِرْتَ بِهِ فَكَمْ تَجِرُ فِيهِ مِنْ جَوْهَارٍ شَرِيفٍ And if you are lucky enough, he says, to achieve taqwa, we all have taqwa, by the way. So he's not talking about the taqwa of the base taqwa that we all have. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. We all have that base taqwa. Here he's talking about that those three things. Disciplining the desires, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we're uncomfortable in our nafs, and seeking Allah's help, achieving those higher maqams of taqwa. How many honorable jewels will you find? Well, and so much good you would accomplish. And how much provisions, honorable provisions you'll achieve. Well, a thousand could be an, an incredible success. Well, mulkin azim, and you'll have incredible like dominion. فَكَأَنَّ الْخَيْرَاتِ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ جَمَعَتْ فَجُعِلَتْ تَحْتَ هَذِهِ الْخِصْلَةِ الْوَاحِدَةِ الَّتِي هِيَ تَقْوَى Like what he said now is so beautiful. He said, it is though all of the good of the dunya and the akhira of this life and the next life, were brought together and put under one simple characteristic, and that is taqwa. He says, so think about how the Qur'an talks about taqwa. Sayyidina Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salam, 
one time he was passing by the grave, graves of people. And he said to his students, if those people in the graves could say something, what do you think they would say? And all of them had like kind of different uh, assumptions. And then he said, they would tell you to have taqwa. Like subhanAllah, they would tell you to have taqwa. فَكَمْ عَلَقَ بِهَا مِنْ خَيْرٍ وَكَمْ وَعَدَ عَلَيْهَا مِنْ أَجْرٍ وَثَوَابٍ وَكَمْ أَضَافَ إِلَيْهَا مِنْ سَعَادَاتٍ And so then he says, like, if you think about وَتَأَمُلْ مَا فِي الْقُرْآنِ الْكَرِيمِ مِنْ ذِكْرِهَا Think about how the Qur'an mentions taqwa and how it has related to it, to all kinds of good in the promise of the great reward for the people of taqwa and the benefits they will achieve. And how much pleasure they will have. And he says, I'm going to mention 12 of them for you. 12 benefits of taqwa in the Quran. Uh, my glasses. The first is that the people of taqwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises him. Qala ta'ala, wa in tasbir wa tattaqu fa inna dhalika min azm al-umur. In Surah Al-Imran, if you are resilient and you have taqwa, that is an incredible thing. Wa thani al-hifza, al-hifza, al-hifzu, wa al-hirasatu, min al-a'da, is protection from one's enemies. Wa in tasbir wa tattaqu la yadurrukum kayduhum shay'a. Again, Surah Al-Imran, if you are resilient and you have taqwa, their plots will not harm you in any way. The third is the help of Allah. Allah is with the people of taqwa and he's with the people of good. Allah is the aider and helper of the people of taqwa. الرابع النجاة من الشدائد ورزق من الحلال is that a person will be saved they will achieve salvation from difficulties and hardships and that they will have halal provisions قال الله تعالى Allah says ومن يتق الله يجعل له مخرج ويرزقه من حيث لا يحتسب whoever has taqwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide that person an exit strategy out of any situation and provide for that person where they would have never assumed. The fifth is that taqwa helps us rectify and reform our deeds. Allah O you who believe, O oh, you believers, have taqwa and speak the truth. Allah will rectify your deeds for you. The sixth, ghufran al dhunub The sixth is forgiveness. Qala Allah ta'ala, wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum. Whoever has taqwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he will forgive their sins. Wa sabi' mahabbatullahi subhanahu wa ta'ala, the love of Allah. In Allah, how you hate one with taqeen. Allah loves the people of taqwa. With them in al qabulu she's okay, no problem. Let her, let her, let her be a, a, a kid. It's okay, yeah. It's okay. You can shut the door if you want to. Thank you. You have to let kids be kids, man. With them in al qabul the eighth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept that person. Indeed, Allah only accepts from the people of taqwa. Honor and the recipients of generosity in this life and the next. Allah so to Hujurat that we explained here in I see why you tafsir so to Hujurat alhamdulillah that indeed the most honorable of you to Allah the people of Taqwa. Wal Ashiru al Bishara to Endal Maut. 
is that at the time of death, a person will receive glad tidings from the angels. Think about Mashallah Sheikh Muhammad Sharif. Ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to give him to give him to him with his grace, and to clean his grave, and to forgive his sins, and to Subhanallah, you know, I heard from Sheikh Abu Isa Naamatullah in his recording that a Sheikh Muhammad Sharif, he died in Salah. Yani initially, he, he didn't die in the Salah. He, he, he had his first struggles with life in Salah, Salat al-Maghrib, on Yom al -Jum And he was buried on Yom al -Jum And there's hadith, the person who dies on the night of Jum'ah ah is guaranteed Jannah. This hadith is Sahih. And the night of Jum'ah ah for us starts the Maghrib, for us on Thursday, that Maghrib actually is the beginning of Jum'ah. Maghrib to Maghrib. But Nas'ar Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Yaj'al Shaykh Muhammad Sharif min al ladina bushiru bi makanihim fil akhira and Allah. So al Bushra, so the time the person dies, they will be greeted by those malaika. They will say, Salamu alaykum. So, Alladina Aman wa Kanu Yatakun, Lahumul Bushra, Fil Hayati Dunya, wa Fil Akhira, La Tabadi, Lari Kalimati, La Lari Kadino Kayim, or La Kenna Akthar and Nas, La Yalam. Subhanallah. The eleventh and Najatu Menanar to be safe from hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Thumma nunajji ladina taqo. Then we saved, we granted salvation to the people of taqo. Wa qala subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa sayujannibu hal atqa. So to layl, we will save those people of taqo from hell. Wa thani ashara, al khururu fil jannah. The oath to reside forever in jannah. Allah said about Jannah, Jannah was prepared for the people of Taqwa. This is So he said, These are the guarantees of taqwa in this life, in the next. So do not be negligent and forget your portion of that good, O oh, Muslim. Then he says, ثم الذي يختص به هذا الشأن من أمر العباد من أمر العباد ثلاثة أصول. Then there are three things, more or less, that are going to help a person, a servant of Allah, stay on the path of taqwa to control the nafs. Remember the context here. أحدها التوفيق والتأييد أولا. اللهم زدنا توفيقا وتأييدا يا رب العالمين. The first is that Allah subhanahu wa taala guides the heart of that person and assist that person internally and externally. Quran says, So one of the, the signs in our life that is what he's saying here. There are three things that are specific to the servants of Allah. 
when it, it comes into the context of taqwa. And the first is that they find Allah SWT has given them tawfiq wa ta'yeen, facilitation. What does tawfiq mean? The ability to balance everything in my life to the point that it doesn't sacrifice my akhirah. And to have everything lined up for a successful akhirah, alhamdulillah, that minimizes perhaps the challenges I may face in this life. And then to find assistance in my life to do those things. Had the ta'eed. Allah says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, inna Allah ma'al ladhina ma'al muttaqina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with the people of taqwa. Wa thani islahu al-amari wa itmami taqsiri. Wa huwa lil-muttaqin kama qala Allah ta'ala yuslih lakum a'malakum. And that the person will find their worship is complete. It's whole, it's right, it's a sign of taqwa. وَثَارِثُوا قُبُوءَ الْقَبُولُ Here it says قُبُول, but the word is not قُبُول, it's قَبُول الْعَمَل وَهُوَ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ كَمَا قَالَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَلَى إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَّرُوا اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ That a person of taqwa, their deeds will be accepted in the hereafter. وَمَنْ دَارُوا الْعِبَادَةِ عَلَى هَذِهِ الْأُمُورِ الثَّلَاثَةِ التَّوْفِيقَ أَوَلًا so he said, he's going to explain it again. What did I mean by tawfiq? Success is that a person is guided to do good. Tawfiq al-amal. Then the third, the second, excuse me, is islah. Now I'm doing things, but let me now work on improving my sincerity, improve the quality of the act. Until it becomes whole. Then when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the action, inshallah, will be accepted. And these are this famous dua of the righteous people that they used to say this. And this dua encapsulates these ideas that we just talked about, how taqwa starts with tawfiq, to do good, then islah, to edit the good I've done, to improve it, and finally al-qabul, that it's accepted by Allah. He said, because of that, some of the righteous people used to say, Rabbana ulul wafiqana li ta'atik. Guide us to obey you. Wa atim taqsirana. And make whole our shortcomings. وَتَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا And accept from us what we've done. So, a tawfiq wa islah wa qabul wa guidance improving my deeds and then inshallah ultimately they're accepted. وَقَدْ وَعَدَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَى ذَلِكَ كُلَّهُ عَلَى التَّقْوَى وَأَكْرَمَ بِهَا الْمُتَّقِيَّةِ and so he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised these things for the one that achieves taqwa. What is taqwa told by Allah? And that that person of taqwa will be honored and granted these things. So therefore, focus on taqwa. If you want to establish worship. Remember, the goal of the book is to establish worship. So worship is conditioned on controlling our nafs in obedience. What's the key to that? Taqwa. He said, if you want to worship Allah truly, then you have to think about taqwa. And he said, in fact, if you want success in this life, and the next, then also you should uh, focus on uh, taqwa. No. Right, inshallah, we're going to stop here, inshallah. Ask Allah SWT, yataqabbal, inshallah. This effort to try to finish this text, Alhamdulillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of planners. 
and ask Allah to forgive me for any of my mistakes in my time. Uh, I'm sure there were many mistakes in my time with you guys. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, insha'Allah. It was certainly an honor to be with you in person as well as uh, online. But Jazakam Allahu Khairan, Barak Allahu Fikum, Sallallahu Wasallam Ala Sayyidina Muhammad, Wasallam Alaikum, Warahmatullahi Ta'ala, Wabarakatuh.